Every building has a foundation, walls, roof, flooring and many other common elements. But this doesn't mean that all the buildings are the same. They can be classified or grouped into different types based on different factors such as the size of the building, the height of the building, the life of the building and more. However, buildings are mainly differentiated based on the activities that take place in it or for the purpose it has been occupied. This type of classification is known as classification of buildings based on the type of occupancy. It is the most basic type of classification which we can easily observe around us. In fact, all of us do use this type of classification in our daily life. For example, we use the term residential building for the place where we sleep and accommodate to perform most of our daily activities. And we use the term educational building for schools, colleges and universities. Talking about the history of classification, you see that there is no proper documentation found between prehistoric period and the modern period about it. However, we can observe from various writings and existing monuments that there were different types of buildings being used for different purposes. A very basic example to prove this is the existence of castles, temples, churches, mosques, tombs, which are completely used for different purposes. We can even observe different types of buildings being used in one of the earliest civilization on the earth, that is in Mesopotamia. So even though there were different types of buildings, but no proper documentation is available until this study has been enhanced by a French author, teacher and architect, J. N. L. Durand, in his famous books in the 18th century. The study and documentation of buildings having similarities in their type of function or form is referred as building typology. Classification of buildings can be done based on various factors of which it includes classification based on the type of occupancy as we have discussed and you can also classify buildings based on the life of structure as permanent, semi-permanent and temporary and then comes the classification of buildings based on the similarities which any person can find by simply observing it. So these type of classifications include classification based on the size such as small, medium, etc. and based on the materials used for walls like brick masonry, stone masonry and block masonry buildings and based on the type of the roof like sloped roof building, flat roof building and nonetheless based on the height as high-rise buildings or low-rise buildings. The basic use of building typology is that it can describe the aesthetical or functional features of a building in a single word. But there are even more applications of building typology in the study of architecture and civil engineering. We will uncover the details about how the study of building typology equips us with a lot of support for planning or designing in the next video. So you know that there are different types of buildings, but you may have a question that why should you know them? The answer to this question lies within the definition of building planning. Building planning or designing is a procedure where you are going to divide an area of the site by considering the available funds in such a way that there is enough space for all the activities with optimum ventilation, illumination and other features. In the first point, I have mentioned that as a planner, you need to allocate enough space for different activities. So, you need to know what activities are going to take place in a particular type of building. Once you know the activities, you will then get to know about the space required for each activity. 
to research and come up with a new list of activities for every new building is not a good idea because it increases the time for creating a plan and it has a great risk of failure because it has not been tested. Hence, architects and engineers have documented and grouped the similar types of buildings with specific names as residential, educational, mercantile, etc. Over time, the requirements of different buildings have been realized, the optimum dimensions for different rooms were known, and all this information has been noted to use in future. So building typology has made it possible to work quickly by following the suggestions noted from the past experiences. Building typology has also greater application in town planning. The identification of types of buildings has allowed a town planner to decide that the main government buildings and hospitals will be at the center of town easily accessible to everyone. And the areas for shopping and uh, other recreational activities will be placed in a manner that they would least affect the residential area with their noise. Many building types have emerged due to a specific change in conditions of an area. The background story behind the emergence of the new type of buildings will help us to know more about their application and to decide whether they will remain advantageous even after the conditions have changed or not. For example, in India, the growth of row type houses in Mumbai called Charles have increased due to rapid urbanization in the early 20th century, but now people are moving to apartments due to change in lifestyle and growth in economy. The word occupancy refers to the action or fact of occupying a place. And the nature of the occupancy of a building defines the type of activities that take place in it. Classification of buildings based on occupancy is widely used across the construction industry. Buildings are grouped into nine types under this classification as residential, educational, institutional, assembly, business, mercantile, industrial, storage, and hazardous buildings. Of the buildings that don't fall into any one of the above groups, it is decided as a group which is similar in operations of any one of the nine groups even for a small extent. Defining the buildings based on occupancy provides us with quick information about the type of rooms needed for the building. In contrast, any other type of classification doesn't provide these basic details. For example, a business building can be a high-rise building. In this statement, you can observe that the word business building clearly defines that this space is going to be used only for a part of the day for activities like business transactions, maintaining of accounts, and records. Whereas, the word high-rise building doesn't provide such details. Therefore, classification of buildings based on occupancy is more useful, and hence we will further discuss the details of nine types of buildings that are derived from it. A residential building is the one which is having sleeping accommodation with or without dining or cooking facilities. The primary purpose of a residential building is the habitation of people. As per the respective master plan of the concerned city, some space of a residential building can also be used for other purposes such as for an office or shops. 
A residential home includes a single or multi-family house, apartments, stalls, duplex type houses, lodging, hotels, hostels, and more. However, buildings like hospitals, penal and mental institutions don't come under this category because they are classified into another group as institutional buildings. Residential buildings are classified based on various factors. Initially, what we can agree as a basic factor for classification is if they are mobile or permanent. They can further be classified depending on the type of roof as sloping roof or flat roof houses. Based on the time people reside in it, it can be classified as a home, apartment, lodging, or hotels, etc. Expensive houses can be further classified into different types as cottages, villas, bungalows, mansions, palaces, etc. However, the classification of a residential building that we are concerned about is the one issued by our respective building code, which focuses more on the details that are important from an engineering point of view. Following are the types of residential buildings that we will discuss. Detached house, semi-detached house, row houses, flats, apartments, and duplex type houses. This type of classification is derived from the way a building is connected to the adjacent neighboring buildings. We are going to discuss more in detail about this type of residential buildings. A detached house is a residential building which is occupied by a single family without sharing any wall or structural member with adjacent buildings. A detached house may be one or two story building with one or more bedrooms having attached toilets. It also contains a drawing room, dining room, kitchen, and veranda enclosed by a compound. Before the Industrial Revolution, most people lived in multi family dwellings, and people from the countryside used to live in houses which were near their farming land isolated from other buildings. In the 20th century, after the economical situation started to improve, people had enough money and they started to prefer detached houses. The advantages of a detached home is that it is private to the owner and family. Hence, extension of the house is possible whenever necessary. Detached houses offer independence, good ventilation, elimination, and maximum privacy. The cost advantage per square feet will be more if it is built in an area where plenty of land is available, which is the case when uh, if the land is purchased away from the main center of the town. And in this case, the price of the plot is also less. The owner can also enjoy the benefits of landscape or yard if more open space is available. Talking about the disadvantages, maintenance and construction cost is higher. Energy consumption is more because of its very high surface area to volume ratio. There is a lack of security and even the nearest neighbors may not rush to them at the time of emergency. Also, the children brought up in detached houses tend to be egoistic and self-centered. Residents get culturally isolated and uh, you see that many times residents don't know neighbors. The low density of housing leads to less frequent bus service and longer distances to commute, thus leading to increased car use. The low density nature of this type of housing requires using more land which could otherwise be used for agriculture or as natural habitat. A building with two house units sharing a common wall is known as semi-detached house. It is nothing but a combination of two detached houses with common wall between them. 
They are built in pairs in which the layout of each house is a mirror image of others. In the case of semi-detached houses, it is desirable to have a common wall running in a north to south direction. One cannot surely derive the exact history behind emerging of semi-detached houses, but I have learned that they were born in the countryside by 17th century landowners wishing to house their laborers cheaply. The advantages of semi-detached houses are that the cost of construction is reduced. It has also the advantages of illumination and ventilation as three sides of a building is surrounded by open space. Semi-detached houses provide neighborhood, security, and amity. Children readily mingle with neighbors and have sufficient open place for playing at or nearer to their house. The disadvantages of semi-detached buildings is that if both the houses do not reflect as a mirror image, then the appearance of a building is affected. Orientation and sanitation for one house are excellent, whereas it is to be compromised for other building. Extensive renovations of one particular building or one portion of the house may not be possible. The privacy when compared to the detached buildings is reduced in this case. So comparing to the detached house, semi-detached house has an advantage of more security and good neighborhood which outperform the disadvantages like low privacy and less freedom to renovate. A row house, as the name suggests, is one of many houses in a row. This style is mostly found in densely populated urban areas where space is limited. The Industrial Revolution in the late 16th century saw an influx of population from rural areas to industrial towns and cities, and hence space became an issue. The cost of the land near the center of the city or marketplace has increased. Also, for much of the 19th century and early 20th century, you couldn't build far upward as structural engineering was not developed to that level. Therefore, a high-rise apartment building was out of cushion. Hence, the owners built houses in a row with a confined area as it was more economical and profitable for them. Due to the high demand by population coming to the urban areas, these houses got easily occupied. Both the sites of a row house have a common wall shared with adjacent houses. Only the front and rear sites were open for ventilation and illumination. Row houses are of different types and there are no way related to apartments because row houses have only two sides open to ventilation, whereas an apartment can have ventilation from three or four sides of the building. The first row house type that we will discuss in this video are terrace houses. These are row houses which are built at the same height with a common elevation. The terrace house is more stylish than any other row house because it looks like a single large building even though it is divided into different parts in a row. The other floors of a terrace building may be shared or rented or owned by others. They are popular in UK since the 17th century. The next type of a row house is the town house. These are buildings in a row but their height and elevation is nowhere related to the adjacent buildings. These are typically row type houses with a feeling of a detached house. Its upper floor is owned by the same owner, that is it doesn't have neighboring units above or below them and therefore it is a single dwelling whose area is divided across multiple floors with adjacent sites being covered by other buildings. In British usage, the townhouse originally referred to the city residence owned by noble people or main people with great respect in the society or wealthy family. The townhouses have rooms on all floors with habitation 
also for servants. Now, let us talk about the third type of rare house. These are chawls and these are specifically seen in the western part of India, especially in cities like Mumbai. They were occupied by relatively poor people. They were constructed mainly near textile mill areas and railway stations for workers who came to a city like Mumbai in the early 1900s. As an obvious nature of people wanting to stay close to the working area, more demand was there and those buildings were easily occupied. These buildings had balconies which were also used as passageway. A chawl consists of one all-purpose room, a kitchen and a dressing room. Usually four or more shared bathrooms were there for each floor. Buildings with separate bathrooms for each dwelling were also available but were costly than others. Talking about the advantages of rear houses, children will learn the art of coexistence and harmonious living. The inmates come to help other neighbors, maximum security access, it is relatively cheaper than a detached and semi-detached house. Talking about disadvantages, ventilation and natural illumination is a main issue because it is completely reduced. There is less privacy because of the common walls between the house. Gossips and trivial news travels quickly. The world has already seen the development of compact and low-rise buildings like townhouses and terraces due to the rapid growth in the urban population. The land in the vicinity of the center of the town has become limited and further expansion of the cities would increase the transportation costs and it also reduces the agricultural land of the country. Hence, it became important to grow the buildings vertically over a limited area. This necessity has been fulfilled with the development in structural engineering and invention of huge machinery like cranes, elevators, and lifts. So finally, space has been made available by constructing tall buildings with many floors. The buildings were then divided into small housing units which are called as apartments or flats. An apartment and flat refers to the same type of dwelling, except apartment is used in American English, while the flat is used in British and Indian English. The word unit is also used to refer to apartments in conversations like, I am going to rent a unit in this building. In some regions, apartments which are sold individually are referred to as condominium or a condo. While the individual units are called as apartments or flats, the multi-story building in which at least three such units are present is called an apartment building, apartment complex, flat complex, and more. After the elevator was invented, the construction of high-rise buildings has become permissible. The high-rise apartment building is referred to as a residential tower or apartment tower. An apartment may be detached or semi-detached housing unit. It generally occupies only a single story and in an apartment complex, the ground floor is generally used for parking. An apartment may be further classified into different types based on different characteristics as follows. The smallest self-contained apartments are referred to as studio or bachelor apartments. It consists of a large all-purpose room with a kitchen and a separate bathroom. The basement apartment is the lowest floor of a building. One dwelling with two stories is an apartment which is having two stories joined internally by stairs. Apartments may also be classified based on a number of rooms as one bedroom, two bedrooms, three bedroom apartment, etc. Other features like commercial area at lower floors and gardens or lawns are also used as factors for further classification. 
Now let us talk about the advantages of apartments or flats. An apartment or a flat is more compact and detached, hence they offer great privacy with good sanitation. An apartment can be designed for any number of rooms with desirable orientation. The apartments have a compact design that has enabled to reduce the expenses for the installation of building services like plumbing and electricity. They offer better security and also with high-tech security arrangements like CCTV. Flats are more convenient for owning than the detached house as general maintenance is taken care by a committee of residents. The apartments in a floor have access through foyer from the staircase with minimum horizontal distance for reaching the housing unit when compared with the row type houses. Common facilities like club, playground, swimming pool and more are also available. So that's about the advantages. Now talking about disadvantages, they are very few but I would like to mention them. Except for a garden apartment, you will have no chance to grow trees or plants. By the way, a garden apartment is an apartment where you are also provided with a specific area in front of the building usually to be used for gardening. Individual flat owners may not have the flexibility to improve the premises to his needs. In the modern day urban cities, apartments are the most efficient type of buildings that can serve as good accommodation while also saving the agricultural land in a country. They also act as a venue for learning the art of coexistence with good discipline and makes an individual socially more responsible. A duplex plan has two living units attached to each other, either next to each other or above each other. A horizontal duplex house is different from semi-detached buildings as the later has two units built on two different properties while the duplex is built on the same property. A duplex house can have an individual or separate entrances for each unit. It is occupied as a home or residence of two closely related families, like families of two brothers, parents and children, under one roof, each one of them occupying a single unit. The term duplex is not extended to three unit and four unit buildings as they would be referred to with specific terms such as triplex and fourplex or more general multiplex. Residential buildings are also occupied for a short period of time, especially by travelers and tourists. These type of residential buildings are usually rented per day instead of a month. Buildings like hotels, lodging, dormitories, and more fall under this category. Such buildings are available in large numbers at tourist spots, pilgrimages, and urban areas. This type of accommodation is also seen in the earliest civilizations. Japan's Nishiyama Onsen Kuanka, founded in 705, was officially recognized by the Guinness World Records as the oldest hotel in the world. During the Middle Ages, various religious orders at monasteries would offer accommodation for travelers on the road. In this type of residential buildings, apart from sleeping accommodation, various other facilities are also available. Facilities provided may range from a modest quality mattress in a small room to large suites that have bigger, higher quality beds, a dresser, a refrigerator, a flat screen television, and more. Small, lower priced hotels may offer only the most basic services and facilities, whereas larger, high priced hotels may provide additional guest facilities such as a swimming pool, business center, tennis or basketball courts, gymnasium, and more. Hotel rooms are usually numbered or named to allow guests to identify their room. Most of the hotels are a combination of residential 
and commercial buildings. Utmost care is taken to prevent fire accidents and other problems in this type of buildings. Moreover, additional rules and regulations are to be followed for planning such buildings. Educational buildings are schools or colleges imparting education to students. They function only for a part of the day where accommodation only for sitting or working is needed. Museum, library, school, college, university buildings fall under this category. The schools for priests, scribes, and other social classes in ancient Egypt, Babylon, and Assyria were evidently located in temples. As much of education was concentrated in the hands of the priest. The principal educational buildings of ancient Greece consisted of a rectangular enclosed peristyle which had several rooms leading off it. After the medieval period, education became more complex. The number of lecture halls increased and some featured amphitheater seating. Most general education schools had modest single-story buildings with several classrooms. In the countries of the Islamic East, the principal educational building was the madrasa. Until the 20th century began, there was very less development in educational buildings. In the 20th century, small-sized schools usually consisted of a single block which was precisely divided into basic functional groups like a classroom, a study room, laboratories, and workshop. The higher education building was a single integrated building consisting of blocks adjoining each other or a composition of several individual buildings. This type of composition was often called as pavilion composition. In a pavilion composition, separate buildings for various departments were available, and most of these buildings had their own individual designs. In many countries, groups of large educational buildings, such as those of universities and polytechnic institutes, constitute a separate community or campus. Most of the buildings were usually built to standardized designs. Individual buildings may also be grouped around a central open area. Large medical and technical higher educational institutions and universities are situated on the peripheries of cities or in suburban zones. Building used for medical or other treatment or care of persons are known as institutional buildings. They ordinarily provide sleeping accommodation for the occupants. They include hospitals, orphanages, old age homes, jails, and prisons. Let us discuss in detail about each one of these buildings. Hospitals. These buildings are under single management, used for housing persons suffering from physical limitations. The English words hospital, hostel, hotel, and hospice are all etymologically related to the Latin noun hospice, which means host, guest, or stranger. All successful hospitals, without exception, are built with good planning, good design, and good administration. To be successful, a hospital requires a great deal of preliminary study and planning. Orphanages, a building under single management used for the custody and care of orphans are called as orphanages. The building may be used to take care of children aged 
infirm or orphans. The construction of an orphanage follows two main goals. The first goal is considering the needs of the children to achieve a desirable and optimized system. The second goal is to achieve a standard pattern to design the centers considering climatic and native issues. Old age homes. Old age homes are for older people who have nowhere to go and no one to depend on. These homes create a friendly and family-like atmosphere for elderly people where they can share their joys and sorrows and live happily. Old age homes are pretty developed in the United States, United Kingdom, and there is recent development seen in the construction of old age homes in India. Old age homes also have special medical facilities for senior citizens such as mobile health care systems, ambulances, nurses, and provision of well-balanced meals. Penal and Mental Institutes A building or a group of buildings under single management which is used for housing persons who are detained for penal or corrective purposes come under this category. In these buildings, the liberty of the inmates is restricted. Examples of such buildings are jails, prisons, mental hospitals, or reformatories. A prison should provide safe and secure conditions for prisoners and staff. It should also provide a decent quality of life. Provision of basic living conditions such as light, water, sanitation should be given importance. Designing of prison should take into consideration of the number of prisoners that are to live in it. The necessary regulation, control of movement, and various facilities should also be considered to support the rehabilitation of prisoners. Assembly buildings are relatively larger buildings. They accommodate more number of people for a stay of a relatively short period of time. They are occupied for social, cultural, religious, recreational, or political meetings. They include assembly halls, community halls, museums, club rooms, church, mosque, temple, recreational halls, and stadiums. In early human settlements, People used to meet in open areas, generally under a tree. However, by the earliest civilizations, a king's court was used to discuss the public problems. The palace itself had so many sections for various types of public gatherings. Religious buildings seems to exist from long ago. In one of the earliest civilizations of Mesopotamia, the temples called ziggurats were there. The religious center of Athens was Parthenon, which was dedicated to their god Athena. In Rome, the Colosseums were there. It was a huge site for elaborate public shows called circuses. They included acrobats, wild beast fights, public executions, and battles between professional warriors called gladiators. During the Renaissance, along with paintings and sculptures, there was even a rise in theatres. Shakespeare's playwrights became so successful that in 1599, his theatre company was able to build a permanent playhouse in London, that is, the Globe Theatre. Assembly buildings are classified based on the number of people it can accommodate and also based on other elements like a stage, seating arrangement, and more. <laughs> Business buildings are meant for public transactions like offices, 
banks, research laboratories, clinical test laboratories, and libraries where accounts and records of its activities are also maintained. They shall be kept open during part of the day as a bank, gas station, etc. The buildings used for professional establishments and service facilities also come under this class of buildings. Although there is not much information about the history of business buildings, one could clearly say that much of it has been built only after the Industrial Revolution because it is where the shift has taken place. Otherwise, you would see that before the shift, most of the people were actually working in the farm, while some were working in the markets selling their goods, and others were working as laborers or as soldiers. Although business buildings were late, they began with a huge demand, and hence, they were mostly tall, occupying a number of employees. Professionals from different backgrounds use these buildings for daily work and meetings. While normal employees are seated in common areas such as cubicles, the managers and other officials have separate cabins or rooms. Provision of services like 24 hours of electricity, water closets cannot be compromised in a business building. Mercantile buildings involve money transaction towards purchases. Shopping complexes, markets, showrooms, storage and servicing centers come under this category. These are the buildings used as shops, stores for display and sale of merchandise either wholesale or retail. Earlier, there were open market areas. People used to sell across the streets of a market while some used the ground floor of their home for storing and selling goods which can be seen in ancient Egypt. Today, the mercantile buildings have taken a name as a shopping mall or complex. Usually, this type of buildings were held as a separate building or they were occupied in the lower floors of any other type of buildings. You can generally observe that the lower floors of assembly buildings like cinema theatres or lower floors of residential buildings are used as a mercantile building. The mercantile buildings are well furnished and have good interior design. They are more attractive and have a pleasant atmosphere. Air coolers and artificial illumination are used throughout the day. The designing of a mercantile building differs based on the products that are sold in it. Planning authorities of most of the regions around the globe have set certain rules and regulations to maintain safety and security in these type of buildings. Industrial buildings are specially constructed structures to manufacture products after processing, assembling, and fabricating. Laboratories, factories, foundry, cleaning plants, power plants, pumping stations all come under the industrial buildings. They invariably harbor men and machinery and also involve risk. More care is to be exercised to render the building fireproof. Industrial buildings are subdivided into different categories on the basis of the degree of hazard. In ancient times, the earliest production was limited to the household. Nocritus is said to be the only factory in entirety of ancient Egypt. The largest factory production in ancient times was of 120 slaves at Athens in 4th century BC. The earliest proper factory milling installations appeared in the Islamic world from the 8th century onwards. The large population increase in medieval Islamic cities, such as Baghdad's 1.5 million population, led to the development of large-scale factory milling installations with higher productivity to feed, 
and support the largest growing population. One of the earliest factories was of John Lombe's water-powered silk mill at Derby, which was operational by 1721. Henry Ford further revolutionized the factory concept in the early 20th century with the innovation of mass production. Highly specialized laborers, situated alongside a series of rolling ramps, would build up an automobile. This concept dramatically decreased production costs for virtually all manufactured goods and brought about the age of consumerism. Storage buildings were constructed mainly for the storage and preservation of goods. They include warehouses, cold storage go-down, garages, barns, and stables. Building or part of building used for sheltering vehicles and animals like garages, hangars, stables also belong to this class. A relatively small number of persons live in proportion to the area in these type of buildings. A cool and dry place with less ventilation and illumination is required for effective storage. Storage buildings are not suitable for storing highly combustible or explosive materials. If a building intended for storage is used for other purposes, its classification is to be changed according to the new usage. For example, if a garage is used for office purpose, it shall be treated as a business building and not as a storage building. Hazardous buildings. These buildings store, manufacture, or process hazardous products which are explosive, highly inflammable, poisonous, irritating, corrosive, and readily ignitable. These buildings need to be isolated from the rest of the buildings so that in case of any accident or leakage, the damage occurred should be a bare minimum and confined to the limited area. There are few products which are very dangerous and when they are stored in a particular building, then you need to consider that building as a hazardous building. However, in order to exactly determine what makes a building a hazardous building, you need to better contact a respective government department in your local area which deals with this subject. If storage under pressure of more than 0.1 Newton per square millimeter is there and quantities exceeding 70 cubic meters of acetylene, hydrogen, ammonia, chlorine, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and methyl dioxide, gases subjected to explosion, fume, cryogenic gas, flammable liquids, rocket propellants, explosive materials other than liquids, buildings used for manufacture of artificial flowers, synthetic leather ammunition, explosives, and fireworks all can be stored in a building which belongs to this class.